Wow. Wasn't quite expecting to be this far away. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, eSports today. And I think that you know, one of the really important things to talk about in a conversation around eSports is what is an eSport? Uh, so Ralph, you have the onus uh, of explaining this to us. Yes. So thank you for having me. Um, well, it's based on video games, right? eSports, electronic sports. That's how kind of it grew up and was nurtured. It's basically games which you can play against each other. So comparing to traditional sports, it's more a football or a tennis rather than you know, running against time where you try to run for a record. So high score games are typically not um, seen as eSports. And then it can be any type of game in a fantasy world. It can be a sports simulation, a racing game, a anything where there's act after all a winner in a competition. And this, but, but the key here is that it's, it's, it's professional. You know, there, there is money to be won. There are arenas and stadiums being filled with people who, instead of sitting around an arena watching uh, people playing football, they're watching people playing video games, right? Like that's the key. That, that is a new normal, yes. But yeah. I, would, I mean, if you define esports, I would start in the amateur part, start in the grassroots. So, I mean, any sport has, has its own talent uh, pool, which is built on in Europe very much on a club model in local clubs and the US more on a school model with high schools. Um, that, whole, that whole infrastructure is part of the esports industry and then on top, it is very comparable to Wimbledon tennis. Um, it's the same and what people couldn't have imagined 10 years ago and we knew because we were into it is that people will come and watch and that kind of makes it a relevant sport rather than um, a niche. Well, you know, um, any sports there is there may be physical or mental exertion. There's acquisitions of skills, and then the, it ends with the competition. So I think esports would definitely qualify. Yeah. So um, give us, can you just give us a sense? Because I, I definitely want to come to the psychological aspect of this in, in a second. But um, Ralph, can you just give us a sense of how big this industry has grown at this point? You know, what are we, what are we actually looking at when we think about professional esports? Yeah. Sure. I mean it was invented somehow like 20 years ago when people started to compete online and at events. Um, right now, it's considered to have 300 million fans growing at 15% a year. So it's a very steep growth, growth curve. It's among the biggest sports in the world there in spectatorship. Our biggest event in Katowice uh, will have 50 million unique viewers. So just huge. I think if you look at commercialization, money, it's still far behind traditional sports, which is normal because it just takes time for it to develop, for, for uh, media partners, sponsorship to go into. The, the industry will make somehow, depends on how you look at it, $800 million of revenue. So it's relevant, <laughs> but not $100 billion traditional sports style. Yet. <laughs> Yet. So, so Mito, on, on the way over here, we were talking a little bit about how a professional athlete uh, in a, a traditional sport, you know, a football, a soccer game, uh, is called an athlete. And you were referring to esports players as athletes as well. Are they athletes? Yes, I, I think they are. Like I said, you know, if, you're, if, you, the, if there's acquisition of skills and then you finally have a competition, yes, they are athletes. I know traditionally when you think about somebody sitting you know, in front of a computer playing, you don't think of them as traditional athletes. But um, like we were discussing, the US now uh, issues P1 athlete visas to gamers. So I think that would be a, a, you know, a stamp of legitimacy for them. Yeah. And, and maybe to add to that, right, I, I love that you come from the science perspective. I come from the experience mm -hmm. perspective, so to speak. And, and 20 years ago, when we started to play and compete, my two brothers, were with me and continued to do so. And they went on and became professional football players in Germany, played second division. And for them, there was never a difference. So they, they know from the pitch that it's no, they're very close together and not, not a major difference. And then you have obviously the, the science aspect of it. So how long did they play gaming? Like how long did they game till? In terms, they actually stopped to compete. Right. Because they had to pick between football and right. esports and Frankly, there was much more money to be made in football well, there you go. and much more fame to be get right. gotten 15 years ago. Um, but yeah, so, so there wasn't really a time where they had to stop from a physical or technical perspective. It was more choice between careers. 
So, Mita, you spent a lot of time with, uh, with professional gamers, and, and one of the things that I find fascinating is this idea that some of them will retire at 20, 21 years right. old. You right. know, it's very, very young. People think sports players retire early at, you know, 30 perhaps, but 20, 21, they're barely old enough to do full-time work, you know, in the grand scheme of things. How does that play out? Well, so the first thing is they start really young. So they're about 17, 18 when they start. And they sort of peak and retire at the age of 20, 21. And really, I, I, I think actually that's part of the problem when it comes to esports. And it's because uh, there is so much pressure on them that they play very, very long hours. They practice for 14 hours a day or maybe even longer up to 19 and that really you can't sustain that on a regular basis. Now, one of the reasons that they give is that they say that as you get older, your reaction time or your speed and accuracy actually decrease. And actually, to be honest, from the science point of view, there really is no reason why you, know, you would peak at the age of 19, 20. It's really the cumulative effect of fatigue and sleep deprivation that builds up. And it's, it's difficult to fight it because, because uh, you know, they're, it's not, they're a little insecure and you have to play really, really hard to compete because there are younger players coming in who are very, very good. And so, and that, you know, that's how they burn out. Yeah, I, oh. I, I would question that a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think first, in, in most of the games where the players retire that early, it's the first or second generation gamers. Mm -hmm. Means there comes up a new game, Fortnite, League of Legends, Counter-Strike, doesn't really matter. The first generation of gamers are usually the ones that had some pre-knowledge from other games, which they could adapt to that game, and then became the best. But from a talent perspective, they never were. So the second and third generation of players are really the best ones coming in then. And there's usually a cycle of the first two years and another two years. And then the third circle, the, the ones that came in year five to six, they are usually staying longer. You can see that in Counter-Strike, there's players who really started their career 2004 mm -hmm. and continued until 14, 15, 16, 17. Very few, a handful are still active. So that's a career of 10 years plus. I um, mean, League of Legends, if you look at from the first two years, 2010 to 12, tw 13 to 14, there's actually none left. But 15, 16, there's still people playing nowadays in the World Championship. So we just don't have so much data because the sport is new. Right. The pattern that, that we're seeing, I'm seeing, is actually that once you have the best player really on top, they tend to stay there longer. Right. And I hope, I mean, I think, I think that when you have... Uh, you know, when you've sort of uh, ended up with a group of really, really good players, I think those are the players who, who are maybe being mentored correctly and who are taking care of themselves, making sure that they're getting enough rest and honing their skills and getting to the next level. So, so who, who are these mentors? I mean, who, who, is, who is training? Is it, are they training each other? Are they being trained by... <laughs> Older players? Yeah. It, I mean, okay. it's really just starting, right? I mean, five years ago, right. there were basically no mentors. It was maximum an ex-player. So the captain actually retires. The guy who wasn't so good, but still, you know, world-class at a time, he would become kind of the coach, trainer mm -hmm. stuff. Um, right now, as more professional clubs are coming in, as there's more money with the teams generally, they're all building up very similar structures to traditional sports. We have psychologists, we have a fitness coach, someone for nutrition, and someone who understands the game deeply, which is usually an ex-player, like in, in any other in sport any other as well. Right? Most of the coaches are, are retired uh, players of that right. specific sport. So that same pattern is, is just coming in. It's only very, very early. Right. Mm. And, and, and actually, maybe that is what you need to get to the next step. You know, if you want to compete in the Olympics, yeah. you know, putting player well-being number one is how you get an athlete who can compete in the Olympics. Yeah. And getting that entire setup in which, you know, you have a team doctor, you have um, athletic trainers, you have, some, you have a, a psychologist, a nutritionist, you know, somebody to make sure that they get up and stretch because yep. uh, that is how one way a gamer is different from a traditional athlete because in a traditional athlete being physically fit is really never the question right but then they may not be <laughs> physically fit because they're gamers you know they're very good um, maybe they're you know with their wrists and mentally they're very, very active but you need that physical fitness yeah. well, it's, but, it's but interesting that you yeah, go, quickly go add to that i think if you, if you look again traditional sports 1986 uh, argentina became world champion with a diego maradona was 
certainly not in perfect shape, mm -hmm. right? He was small and had a belly. Um, so, and that's different nowadays. Yes. In 2018 yes. in football, you cannot win the world championship without being 100% physically fit. Yes. So the, the competitive pressure yes. of the system is, is making you to, to, to optimize really right. on, on every scale. And that is coming into esports as well. In 10 years ago, no one would worry about physical fitness for a player. Now these teams know from science that, that this will be the last 5% difference. Yes. That this will be, make you more mentally fit in the last minute of the most important match of your life. Right. And to prepare for that is part of being more professional. Well, you, you mentioned Olympics, which is handy because it's the next thing on my, uh, my question list here. I mean, there, there is talk of, of the 2020 Olympics, um, including esports for the first time. I mean, how likely is that to happen? You know, how do we, what's that going to even look like? Yeah, so um, there's a few pieces to that. So first, earlier this year in Pyeongchang, we did a demonstration tournament, which wasn't part of the Olympics, but was in the vicinity of it. Mm -hmm. Then there was in June this year a big, um, a big conference actually in Lausanne where the IOC and the esports industry um, had two days to discuss about this topic. The recent, let's say, messaging was it's not going to be an official Olympic sport soon. Um, in 2020, certainly something around it will happen. The Asian Games this year had it as an official sport. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of you know, happening, but it's happening gradually and step by step. And the largest question really been discussed is the how. Should it be just an, a medal sport for the traditional Olympics or should it be more like the Paralympics to be a separate competition in the same venues, in the same environment, under the umbrella of the IOC, but, um, you know, w w with its own soul and heart and regulations after all. Um, yeah, that is kind of the status quo. I mean, it, it's, uh, mentioning regulation actually is very interesting because, again, Mitra and I on the way over here, we're talking a little bit about whether esports uh, yeah. should be regulated. Uh, and what's great fun for me as a moderator is that I know you two disagree on this topic. <laughs> yes. So, um, Mita, should they be regulated? I, I totally think so. I think so because I think um, if it was regulated and, and also if there was like a players association which put player well-being number one that would take care of players and I'll give you an example like for example in I want to say in 2001 in the NFL um, there was a, a player Corey Stringer who died out because of uh, heat stroke after a practice and then and uh, you know because of that the players association and the league set up these rules of how often you can practice how long the practice should be so the, you know in uh, and we may be talking about different kinds of yeah. regulations but i think that re what the regulation does is it helps esports um, build standardized practice parameters for these players which protects the players well-being and also it gives you it gives you a cheat sheet to be able to say that this player is fit to play Right. I mean, when we were talking about in 1986, you didn't have to be fit, but you could also <laughs> use amphetamine. You could use steroids. You could use anything because anything went and all of those, you know, uh, the stimulants and the drugs could could uh, mask the effects of not getting enough sleep or not, you know, being well prepared. And uh, I know that right now, because of not because you're not regulated, there is so much play, uh, pressure on the players. And so they're likely to use stimulants or you know but is that actually but, happening I, I think so yes well, so <laughs> and it no no it depends on what we're talking about right. so, so regulation for me is not a player association a yes. player association is common sense yes so I, I totally think and after all it's about the players everyone else is just uh, you know uh, flying around it but the players need to be protected and they should have a body to do that mm -hmm. fully agreed I think in terms of all the other risks betting, doping, all that stuff, absolutely you need to take care of it. We are actually doing doping tests at our event, very, very specifically. Mm -hmm. Just out of a very simple commercial reason, mm -hmm. we cannot fall into the same trap as cycling. Yep. So again, common sense is telling you, you should do it. I have, um, to, I have to just pull you out on that one. So w w I mean, what are people uh, being tested for? Like what, what do people in this? We, we're using the same, we're actually not doing blood tests, we're doing salvia tests. And it's specifically the number one 
let's say, potential drug is, is actually amphetamines, um, things that are very typical for students to improve their learning skills. So it's, uh, it's around focusing your mental capacity. Um, that is specifically what we're looking for. It's, it's less um, testosterone or other things, but we do specific doping tests about that, very similar to traditional sports. We work with the different bodies like NADA and WADA a little bit to understand how they're doing it. We're actually not using them uh, directly, but we're using the same methodology to make sure that the sport is clean. And same goes, we, we founded um, an independent body called ESIC, Esports Integrity mm -hmm. uh, Coalition, to make sure that match fixing and all that stuff, someone independent is looking after. It's run by a guy called Ian Smith, who comes out of cricket, which had a big problem actually with right. uh, this stuff. So all of these things I think are total no brainers and need to be done because they are ultimately protecting players and the sport. When, when I talk about regula regulations, I mean governments or IOCs or whoever trying to actually change the sport because they think it makes sense. So well, there I'm extremely like, oh, hell, right? We've, we've seen this week with football leagues what comes out of stuff like this. We absolutely don't need that. And everything in, in life bears a certain risk of, of something happening, but I'd rather have it happening bottom up than top down. Well, I, point. Again, I, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit there. And that's because I think, you know, there's a very thin, um, porous line between addiction and gaming. And I think that some regulation is needed, again, to make sure that, that we protect people who are vulnerable adults who are between the ages of 17, 17 for, uh, 18, 19. Because, you know, they, don't, they may not have the experience nor the education to look out for themselves when it comes to this. Um, just one more point, because I do, I do work a lot with athletes. So I will say, you know, if you, if you told an athlete you take a pill and you'll perform really well the next day, there'll be very few athletes who won't take that pill. You know, it's really, and so that is why, although we don't want, although we don't like regulation, you know, frequent drug tests, et cetera, are really important because they, they, they take that pressure off the athlete to make that decision whether to take it or not. And just one last point, doing saliva testing is bullshit. Doesn't really work. <laughs> so <laughs> then Nara and Vada told us wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, so they, they're, really they're the professionals there. Right, supposedly. right. Right. So, uh, so um, we've got a couple of minutes left before we, we close here. And I want to get a sense from both of you, just one, one big thing each. What needs to change in the industry of eSports? And, and I do say this in the, uh, in the context of professional eSports, in order for it to continue to grow in a healthy way, but also in a way that you know, people would expect and would hope to see. Uh, Mita, why don't we start with you? Well, I think, first of all, I think like, the genie is out of the bottle. There's no going back. I think it's, it's you know, eSports is here to stay and it's only going to grow, which is a good thing. I mean, I would say my suggestion is that if they had, if they put player well-being on top of their list, I think that you would get the complete athlete and they would be ready to compete in the Olympics. No. So, so, yeah, I, I mean, for, for it to grow more, it's actually the local aspect. And I don't mean that uh, you should now change teams to have to be local. But really, when I, when I talk to people in, in the government and like everywhere else, it's, um, it's a local sport club. It's a lot about education and a lot about giving kids a space to do what they like. That's actually what we as society should do for the largest part. And, and for eSport is now a, a purely digital thing, but it's after all extremely social. And to give more social space means that local clubs have their gaming rooms who are actually have an educational piece with it, help them to grow. Yeah. I think that that is really the next thing that will make this from being very big at the, at the top of the pyramid mm -hmm. to be much more broader in wealth distribution, so to speak, right. or in attention distribution and give people and the players, after all, the opportunity to become a star. And not everyone is fit to become a world star, but everyone can achieve something. And if that means I'm the best in my district, in my town, in my school, in my whatever social um, structure I I'm looking at, I think that is super important and that creates aspiration and makes the players happy. And if the players are happy, then the industry will thrive. 
Right. Perfect. I mean, I think, I think what we we've were got talking 17 about, seconds. That what we were talking about college, it being part of college sports would really, you know, help with that. You know, if they were, because then they would, it would be a nice, safe environment to be able to play and compete. Perfect. And with five seconds to go, Mita, Ralph, thank you ever so much. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for coming and watching the talk. Thank you. Thank you.